So here we are once again. I think this is show three. Four. Oh my God. Is it really four? Yes, it's show four. Oh my goodness. How quickly these shows go. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed. I turn my head and here we are again. Anyway, I'm Stephanie, Stephanie Ovadia, and I'm with Michelle DeMayo, as you know, and this is the Steps of Service. And as the show is progressing, we're kind of growing up with the show, somewhat of like baby steps as we take along the way. And we realize what's working, what's not working, but we love the fact, we love the fact that you're interacting with us. And before we even start our show and talk to you first about, of course, our bathroom uh, BS, I'll call it, um, <laughs> let's, let's first tell you that this is an amazing thing, and we're so excited to now to announce that Sharice Richards put a question to us. Actually, she put up more of a proposition to us. And maybe we should think about having her on because what she brought up is the fact that she is in business with her spouse. And she called it love and business. How to go in and build a business with your spouse or a significant other. And she stated, my husband and I have been in business together for almost 17 years now, full time. I can understand her saying full time because maybe most people can handle part time. However, full time is a whole nother story. Oh, don't I know it. And she states it's been an amazing journey to say the least. And, you know, Michelle and I had thought this show was going to be where we were going to talk about who we were. Sort of like backwards, like here's the prequel to the show. We brought you into a show that... We never really talked about who we were. But I think because I really wanted us to talk about Sharice Richards and her sort of proposition, this is the perfect time for Michelle to tell you about herself and to talk about this topic. So take it away, Michelle. All right, well, well hello, everybody. Hi, Steph. Can you believe show four? I'm so I, excited. I it only took us six months to get it together. Now we're on mm -hmm. show four and it's going so fast and we still need to get together. <laughs> I know, I know. And it's going so well. Not only it fast, is. but it's going so well. It is. And it's so much fun. And, and you know, it is exciting that we're finally getting guests that listen to the show, give us topics to talk about. And I love this topic, love and business. That's actually a great topic. And it's funny because she mentioned... She's been working with her husband for 17 years, and I have as well, <laughs> which is crazy. So it's the same amount of years. So it's a cool topic. Yeah. Um, but yes, it's um, it's funny because every time somebody asks me, the first question they say is, you work with your husband every day? And I always say, yes. And they say, are you sure? How do you do that? I wake up, I work with him, and go to bed every day. We've been doing it for 17 years, and it works. Um, and it works really well. And I guess we're very fortunate, especially being in the restaurant business, and you know this, Steph, it's crazy hours, you have late nights, you have parties, you have events, you have so many different things that go on. And if you have a spouse that doesn't understand what you do or what your work environment is like, it's very hard because they can't respect or they can't understand what goes on on a daily basis because most people work regular hours. They get up and they work nine to five or 10 to six or seven or eight in their home and they have dinner together, whereas some nights... I don't get home till 11, 12 o'clock. I mean, you know, you right. text me and I'm still at the restaurant. <laughs> right, right. No, well, absolutely. It's yeah. Right. So, you know, for Gennaro and I, it works so well because what he's strong in, you know, it's not kind of my suit. And what I'm really strong in, it's not his suit. So he's kind of the the back of the house. I'm kind of the front of the house. And I think, Steph, that's why you and I get along so well, wifey, because I yeah. like to be the front talking hostess with the mostest and you like to be the... The back the boss with the sauce in the back rolling yep. through and you know cracking the whip <laughs> yep that's so true though i think that's really why it works because yeah. i have no interest in being the front of the house none yeah and that's kind of my strength and even in the restaurants it's my strength i love to be working the door and on the floor and you know keeping the vibe going and and talking to guests and learning who they are and what they do and it's funny stephanie because you said to me yesterday i'm not the nice one and i laugh because you know, even in the restaurant business, being up front, you know, you have to schmooze and listen to people and take your time. And, you know, you're kind of the, like you said yesterday, I'm the direct. I want to do my business and get in and get out. And, you know, that's kind of how Jannar and I are. You know, he's he's the listener and I'm the talker and the doer. So it works so well. You know, he's yeah. putting menus together and, and running the back and the show. And I'm kind of the, the front, the, it's 
even in the accounting world, they called me the mouth. Well, I guess I'm the mouth and the face, you know, here too. And, um, and that's what's worked great for us. And I'm assuming, you know, Miss Richards also, I guess that's why it works for them because I'm assuming they probably have that, that equality of what's one strength versus the other strength, you know? Right. Sure. Absolutely. You know, I never quite thought about it that way, but you would need that. You can't have ever, even in a, in a marriage, you can't have two people who are the same. You really can't. It, it, you need people who sort of what they say. Why would they say opposites attract? There's a reason for that because they kind of do. Yeah. If everybody was the same, it would be boring anyway. You know, right. everybody's got to bring spice to the, you know, to the, the table. And, um, and, you know, it's worked really well for Janar and I, because, you know, we balance, we have such a good, healthy balance of every day and, and a good partnership. And, you know, if you are lucky enough to work with your spouse and I say lucky, cause we are lucky because we can take the same time off and we can travel and we can celebrate, um, amazing steps in business and, and milestones because we're doing them together. And, um, and that's really lucky. And, you know, when we first started this journey 17 years ago, I didn't know how long it would really last in terms of working together. I mean, obviously we knew we were going to be together and life partners and get married and, but you never know when you start working together. And it's just like we just said, can you believe, you know, you and I have known each other for, for almost four and a half years. It goes so fast. And I can't, we were sitting down talking about everything that we've done and we sat back and we said, wow, it's been 17 years we've been working together. It's crazy goes fast it really goes especially when it works you know when it doesn't work it feels like it's forever it a lifetime <laughs> <laughs> you know when things aren't good you always feel like this is taking forever but when things work time just buzzes right by you because it's easy it's natural and it's organic exactly and exactly that- so you know, definitely thank you for that topic. It's a, it's definitely one that's dear to my heart because I get to work with my spouse every day, just like you do. So we love hearing topics. So hopefully we'll get some more emails and some more questions for our show. Absolutely. That would be, uh, that would be fabulous. So before we even start today, we're supposed to talk about ourselves. So I'm letting you start, start the show and talk about who you are. Ooh, All right. Well, before where we- you came from. I will. But before we even do that, we have to tell them how we met. I think before we do the who's and the why's, you know, I think we should start with you and I. What do you think? Absolutely. We are. It's funny. I keep calling Stephanie my wifey, but yep. you know, we, had, we had a really good friend introduce us, uh, a mutual friend. And it was supposed to be um, kind of a business partnership um, when we had our restaurant in Florida. So Tuscan Prime in Florida brought Stephanie and I together. And um I call it the match made in heaven, my second marriage. Uh, and it's the same thing. You know, look, think about it, Steph. What you bring to the table and what I bring to the table are so different. And Absolutely. they work, you know, because we have passion for what we do. And we're hardworking people and we care. And, you know, we care about each other. And, yeah. and look what we've built. And, you know, truly. And, and there's also a level of loyalty. I need to, like, you know, to me, one of the most important things in all my relationships with people who mean something to me I always find them to be very loyal, honest, trustworthy people. I think that's one of the most important things. I think that's why working with your spouse, if you have the right spouse, of course, works because of that relationship, because you have that bond, that bond of loyalty. um, And trust. And trust is most important, right? Don't you agree? I agree 100%. They're the two most important attributes to me with my friends Yep. my spouse, my family, you have mm-hmm. to be able to trust and care and they have to be loyal. They have to care about you. And, you know, and that's, what's important. And I think that's why you and I work so well too, just because we both have the same values and the same morals and, and the same passion for what we do. So it's been, um, such a great four years, but we really only have started truly working together in, in six months. Right. The past few months have really been where we've made this breakthrough as to what we're doing with our energy yeah and it's been exciting should we well let's we'll tell the listeners at the end all the exciting things we're doing but like you said i'll tell about you because yeah you know what nobody knows who we individually are so well actually i should backstep a moment because i just wanted to say one thing which i didn't get to say the person who did introduce us had said to me what before he introduced us 
he said to me, I need to introduce you to someone who I know you two will be besties. He goes, I just know it. He goes, from the moment I met the two of you and we are completely in different worlds, I have nothing to do with the restaurant business at all, zero. He said, from the moment I met each one of you separately, I knew there would be some amazing synergy between the two of you. He says, don't ask me how, don't ask me why. I've never done this before, but I felt that there was some type of energy that I felt between the two of you. And when I talked to you, I felt that energy. And when I spoke to her, I felt that energy. So it was so interesting how he was right. Yeah, he was. And he, he said the same thing to me. He said, you know, I'm going to, out of the blue, I'm just going to throw this out there. And he said, but you need to meet her. And I think you will do amazing things together. And he was right. I mean, yeah. he, it's funny. He played matchmaker for friends. And I know. It's, it's a crazy thing, but it worked. Yeah. And, and, you know, sometimes people just are able to do that. They have that feeling, they have that energy, and they feel the same way about two people, and they knew that those two people should be together. So I wanted to interrupt you before, just put in my little two cents. So the yeah. floor is yours. Take All right. Now, sounds good. So I'm Michelle DeMeo, like Stephanie said, a.k.a. the Restaurant Diva. And, um, you know, my background is very interesting and I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to give too much of it away because you have to buy my book and buy our book, right, Steph? And yes, absolutely. And I'll give you a little teaser and taste into my world and what we do and how we're doing it. Right. Um, but started in the restaurant world about 17 years ago. Um, my background was nothing restaurant, but I did a lot of franchising and, um, worked in weight loss and health. And it was interesting because it translated really well into what I'm doing now, um, you know, with franchising and business and commercial brokering and real estate and opening restaurants. But um, it's been such a cool journey over the last 17 years. And we've opened restaurants all over the country from Tennessee to Maryland, DC, Virginia, um, Maryland. And now we're growing hopefully soon into New York. Um, we're getting ready to do a project in D.C., but we have restaurants um, from fast casual to full service, uh, fine dining, a wine bar to Tuscan Prime, which is our trendy, vibey, over the top um, Dolce Bar and Chop House. And we're getting ready to do another one in D.C. And, you know, my energy and my excitement is about really building and creating the restaurant diva concept. And, you know, that also um, it's funny, the, the gentleman that introduced Stephanie and I. Um, who said we are going to be amazing friends. He kind of, even though everyone always called me the restaurant diva, I never coined it and never kind of brought it into fruition. But we were having dinner together in Florida at Tuscan Prime. And he's like, you are the restaurant diva. And it just stuck. And, you know, he said, you got to protect it. You got to, that's your thing. You got to really do it. And, you know, ever since we started talking, um, that's where it was kind of truly born and really put into um, into motion and I protected it and started launching it. And now Stephanie and I are really working on building that brand from, you know, um, PR and our podcast now together, the steps of service. And we just launched, um, a new column that we're, we're writing bi-weekly in five different magazines across New York called restaurant diva speaks. And it's amazing to see how much of a personal brand that you can build that was born in the restaurant world, you know? So growing up in the restaurants and learning how to open them and design them and create them and menus and hiring and expansion, now really growing my restaurant diva identity and and keeping it going. So that's kind of just a little bit about me. Um, high energy. I got to at least talk about my children just for two minutes. I know I always no, start with my kid, but um, not only am I a wife and we talked about Gennaro and started the whole show on um, partnerships, but my world and my life is really my children. And um, I have three girls, amazing kids, smart, hardworking. Uh, my oldest just turned 25 this weekend. I have a 20 year old in the Naval Academy, which I'm so proud of her. It's what she's doing and is so life changing and admirable. And then I have my four year old BV who is my little spitfire emotional, amazing hearted little girl that, um, just changes and 
you know, it's very cool having a child later in life. You know, you get to enjoy so much more. Your work schedule's different. Your energy's different. Your patience is very different. Um, so I, I think my most amazing attribute behind my success in the restaurants and personal success is definitely my children. And I know, Stefan, you're going to start off with your kids, but that's they right. really are. They're amazing. And that's mm -hmm. definitely my that most. True. That's so funny. You do know me. Yeah. So, uh, Steph, I'll turn it over to you so you can do your introduction and no one's going to believe how many children you have. <laughs> yeah, that is true. But okay. So who am I? Well, that's a good question. I always say the jack of all trade, Jill. Yeah, of that I always say, ask a busy woman if you want to get the job done. I'm that yeah. busy woman that you can ask anything. And even if I can't do it, I'm going to find somebody who's getting that job done. I mean that seriously. It doesn't matter what the job is. It doesn't matter. I'm going to get the job done in some fashion. I'm going to get the job done. And you know, my greatest situation, I should say of a lifetime is that I am the original mom of eight. So if you want to talk about, you know, John and Kate plus eight and all these other people who had eight children and the woman who had 14 children and this woman and that woman, well, I'm a little older than them, so I qualify myself as the original mom of it. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and there is where age is okay, because I started it. So when they talk about eight children, that was me. I started it. And eight was enough. You know, eight is enough. Eight was enough for me. They're all older now for the most part and doing that thing. Everybody's, you know, keeping themselves busy. Very successful, very successful children. That they, yeah, they're, they're doing that thing. But guess what? I have no grandchildren. So that's really what I want. I can't seem to get myself a grandchild. Like I have tried every which way I have, you know, shown pictures of baby food. I have bought them baby <laughs> toys. I have bought baby wipes. I have bought multiple things for multiple children of mine who of course are over age and of age to have children and um they've sort of like just not paid attention nobody wants to give me a grandchild that's the one thing i really really want oh want. don't worry they will soon you know like don't, don't it's funny because you're gonna say that and then i'm gonna talk to you we'll be doing this show five years from now and you're gonna say i have 10 grandkids <laughs> <laughs> well that's kind of what i want i my goal is over the next few years is to have a couple of grandchildren so I can spoil them and take them into toy stores like I used to do my kids and just let them pick out what they wanted like just silly things that I did with my children that um you know a lot of people would say to me are you crazy but it was always things that I enjoyed it was me living the childhood I never got to live because I didn't you know grow up with parents who had enough money to even go into a toy store so, you know, it was one of those things that I felt very fortunate that I was able to go into Target and tell my kids to pick out what they wanted. And I kind of look forward to doing that with my grandchildren as well. So yeah. that's kind of who I am, mom of eight. Um, as an aside, I'm an attorney. Yeah, just one of those things that I picked up along the way in my career. And uh, I sort of practice law every day. I try cases for a living. I like talking to jurors. I like hearing how in many different languages in many different languages. Yes. I like, I enjoy languages. So I do a lot of depositions in multiple languages because I enjoy that. And you know, that sort of is part of growing up in a family with a mother who spoke five languages. Um, and it was something that I really always enjoyed listening to. So I kind of continued my, um, my love for languages and, uh, for now, I'm going to just keep up what I'm doing. And eventually, I know Michelle and I are going to be amazingly successful. So, um, And then we'll be doing this full time. Right. <laughs> so that will be the end of practicing law. I'll still keep my eight kids. But, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, you don't want to give them away yet. Right, I'm not giving them away, but I think I might give up my... Uh, my full-time date time. Uh, I've heard that a few times. Every time yeah. you try to leave, they, they want you back. They and, don't let me uh, leave. I've been and trying. you know what? You keep telling me you're off Thursdays and Fridays, and every time I call you, you're in a deposition. I know. I know. It's uh, 
one of those things, you know, everybody yeah. wants me to be, to do their depositions. So, you know, depositions, it's very interesting. We'll just talk for a moment, a little aside here for anybody who really cares about this, but you know, as far as practicing law, anybody can get a law degree. Anybody can practice law. Anybody can put a shingle out as long as you're a licensed attorney in that state. You need to be licensed, but as long as you're licensed, you can hang your shingle and you can practice law. That doesn't mean you're going to be a great lawyer and that doesn't mean you can do everything that needs to be done. But there is one part of law that you cannot just walk in and do. And that is depositions. Because there's certain things required to be able to ask questions for three, four, five, seven hours. And it's very interesting, and you might be interested in hearing this, is that while you're in a deposition, you have to think about your case. You have to be listening to the answer, formulating your next question in your head before the person has finished their answer. So it's a very specific thing to do, and it, it takes a lot of energy, effort, and practice. So yeah. that's what I do. It's that whole question, answer, question. You have to listen and know how to, you know, almost think about what they're going to say before they actually say it. It's like yeah. that. You know, it's funny because when I was doing weight loss, um, I used to train. I was a regional vice president for LA Weight Loss for many years. And that's such an emotional sale. And I used to help so many people lose weight. And, you know, you're going into these these consultations and it's the same thing. You know, you're you're asking a question, they're answering, and you're asking another question, and you're you're getting people to open up and you're trying to gather as much information as you can. And exactly what you just said is what I used to do in weight loss. Right. Right. Well, that's that's exactly it. You have to be ready for the next Ask question. On your feet. And I could see that in weight loss because it's a kind of an emotional field. It really you know? is. It's an emotional sale and you know, you're not selling anything. You're selling an idea of what somebody has to look like. You know, they're coming in and they might have to lose 50 pounds or 100 pounds. It might even be 20 pounds. And they right. come into your office and, you know, they don't know what it's going to look like. They might have never, ever felt like that. And, you know, I used to sit down with them and try to get them to envision what they're going to look like. You know, how are you going to feel? How's your life going to change? And, you know, it was um, it was very rewarding. It was re rewarding financially as well as emotionally and physically and spiritually because you change lives every day. I mean, how many people can go into into work every day and say, you know what, I changed a life today. And then they hit their goal and they're crying and they hug you and they lose 100 pounds and their doctor says they've changed their health. I mean, it was such an amazing, um, amazing job to go to every day. I loved it. And, you know, changing what I did, it's like, what I'm doing for myself now, obviously opening franchises and opening business, I'm putting the same passion into my own business, but, um, it was such a rewarding career to do for so long. I mean, I did it for 13, 14 years and a lot of the clients are still my friends, believe it or not. I'm sure that's a long time and it's an emotional type of business. You know, and while we're in this topic, I know we're supposed to talk about restaurants, but it's one of those yeah. things where something that excites me that I want to ask, and you're my expert at this. So I might as well ask you while I have you, uh, here in front of me, you know, with the changes in weight loss today, and when I say changes, I mean these medications, Ozempic and all these other copycats, um, or whatever they are. I don't know yeah. if they're copycats, but you know, I always heard Ozempic first, and then I started hearing all these other names. Um, and you know, kind of in the drug industry, one comes out and every company then follows suit with their own drugs. And also with surgery, I mean, you used to have weight loss surgery, you know, it's been around probably 20, 30 years, but it was only for people who had a ton of money. Now they've kind of scaled it down where it should <laughs> it's not as, you know, strenuous as it was to have weight loss surgery. You don't have to go for counseling for eight months or a year or whatever it was. So my question to you is, do you think the diet industry in and of itself has changed with all these different methods, not the right methods. That's how I feel. And you can feel any way you want people because you don't learn anything. There's not really a learning curve here when you're made, when it's made easy, but up to everybody to do what they want. Um, what do you feel about that? Um, I have very mixed feelings with it. You know, when I used to work in the weight loss industry, we used to teach 
all of our all of our clients and our patients that you have to change the way you think about food. You have to change the way you eat. So all these people out there are like, yes, if you're doing it for nine pounds or five pounds because you just can't lose those few pan, pounds, then I'm all for it. But when you have people out there that really truly have eating issues. You know, they live on sugar. They don't right. eat well. They don't exercise. They're all about desserts and fried food and fast food. And then you give them this drug that just teaches them to not eat because their body is not hungry and it changes how they feel or, you know, it makes their stomach feel like it's smaller or whatever they do. Mm -hmm. The second they stop it, it's not teaching them a behavioral change. So what's that tell you? You know, they're going to lose the weight that they want to lose, whether it's 50 pounds, 80 pounds, whatever it is. But then they get to their goal and nobody's teaching them how to change that behavior. So what that tells me is just like when I used to be in weight loss, they're going to gain all that back. Right. And what's making them healthy just because they're losing weight? That's not teaching their body about burning fat, cardio, um, you know, making their heart healthy, making their body healthy. You know, in order to stay fit and stay healthy, um, you have to know how to eat right and how to exercise and, and how to take care of yourself, mind, body, spirit, emotionally, physically, everything. And a drug's not going to do that. A drug's going to help. You know, drugs are out there to stop symptoms, not cure problems, long-term problems. So they're just treating, you know, just like when you go to the doctor, you have a cough, they give you cough syrup. It doesn't treat the problem. What's the problem? Did you have, you know, upper respiratory infection? Like what is causing it? And that's the same thing with these diet drugs, you know? That person's heavy for a reason. Why are they heavy? You're just giving them a drug to lose the weight. But why are they really gaining the weight? And that's the problem that these drugs aren't fixing. You know, unless they're truly going to a diet doctor that's giving them counseling and teaching them how to change their mindset. Right. Because it appears, like, I'll tell you, I just recently went to a party. And one of the women there looked like she lost about 20 pounds or so. And she was very proud of the fact that she did it with one of these drugs. Like it wasn't Ozempic, it was something else. Mm -hmm. And um, she's like, I don't need anything. I said, you don't need anything? Like we had this long conversation. I said, you don't <laughs> and need you anything? Said that every time I call you, you're eating. So that's I'm always eating. Person. I eat all day long. I mean, all you know, long. all day long, I do. But, you know, I work out a lot. Um, and uh, it just works for me. It keeps me strong and fit and I can just eat all day long and I do. So when I hear somebody say to me, I don't eat, I'm like, okay, well, you have to eat something. You have to eat because if you don't eat, you're gonna be dead. Everybody has to eat. So I don't- I don't know what that do for your muscles. I mean, muscles need food, they need energy. I mean, otherwise you lose muscle and then you're saggy and you have, I don't know. Then you right. become a fat skinny person because your right. body's not healthy. Right. Well, that's the part I don't understand about these drugs. So like I said, this woman was telling me she doesn't eat. Now, I don't really know what that means because she has to be eating something. She'd be dead. And I don't really know what these drugs do. But if she's telling me she's not eating, I'm guessing she's, you know, eating less. Right. Like everything bad that she ate before that she just ate lots of. So what is going to change her? Or is she just going to have to stay on these drugs forever and pray that they never find that there's anything bad caused by them or there'll yeah. never be a shortage or I don't know. I don't know how this works. I don't understand it. Yeah. I just don't see it being long term. I think it's a very short term. I mean, the drug's been around for a long time. I right. mean, it, you know, the drug's out there. They know the side effects. It's been tested. It's FDA approved. I mean, it's not a new drug. They're right. just using it for a new reason. But I agree with you. There's, it's just not long term. I mean, you know, for people that truly need it for health reasons, a thousand right. percent. If you need it because you're hundreds of pounds overweight and you need something to jet start you and get you excited, but mm -hmm. there has to be something that goes hand in hand with it. So, you know, here's your drug to get you started and get you excited and get you motivated to start losing weight. But where's the right hand that goes along with it to teach you behavior and exercise? And, you know, it's just like we started the show with it's, you need that that combination and that match made in heaven of that marriage that has the balance. And, you know, I'm afraid with these drugs that they don't have that balance. And, you know, for those that start the drug and then start working out and start eating healthy and wean themselves off the drug, and now they have great behavioral changes, then I'm all for it. But, right. you know, it's, it's all what you do with it and how you use it. And I think there's a lot of people out, out there using it for the wrong reasons or using it the wrong way. Right. 
Do you yeah. see as a restaurateur, and I don't mean to be interviewing you, but you're the perfect <laughs> expert for this. For me, you're like the perfect expert. I can't control myself. It's that lawyer that comes out of me. I'm like, oh, this is great. I have an expert sitting right here in front of me and I can just ask them all these questions and I'm going to get the right answers. And quite frankly, I always look at it that if I'm interested, everybody out there is just- Well, wait, I got to cut you off for a second. So there was a time where right before, it was actually a couple of years before COVID where the FDA and the restaurant associations and a lot of the government started saying to these big companies, if you had more than 20 stores, you had to start putting your calorie levels on all the menus. I don't know if you remember that, where you do. developed restaurants and you would see calories on every menu. Yes, I do. Okay. So we had to hire a company to come out and do our menus because not for the full service, but for Squisito, because we had so many multiple levels and we were franchising, we had to have nutritional information. So we had nutritional binders. So if somebody came in and said, I have an allergy to this or an allergy for that, we could do reverse lookup to say, okay, well, there's onions if you're allergic to onions in these dishes. So the cooks would be able to, or chefs would be able to not cook with those those recipes or those ingredients to help with allergies. But what it also did was it showed Gennaro and I some of the calorie levels on some of the dishes. And I remember having these calories done and some of these dishes, I w almost had a heart attack. I was like, oh my God, we can't put them on the. There was like, whatever it was, fettuccine Alfredo with bacon and carbonara, whatever. The the grande dish was like 2,500 calories. And I almost had a heart attack. I said to Jaron, like, there's no way we're putting that on the menu. You need to fix the recipe. Because if you put 2,500 cal, and I mean, this is me coming from the, re you know, the weight loss industry, and I'm looking at some of these dishes um, saying, holy cow. Yeah. I mean, you can't put 2,500 calories. That's someone's entire day of food. And yeah. then it makes you really sit back and look at why America is so overweight because some of these restaurants out there are so, the calorie levels are just mind boggling. And a lot of the consumers don't even realize it. Like, you know, and that goes into a whole nother conversation of how we can talk about you know, cultural differences and why people are in, you know, Asia or Italy, you know, everybody here says, oh, pasta and pizza is so fattening. And so you gain weight, but you go to Italy and you don't see people over there that are 300 and 400 pounds and they eat pasta and pizza and drink wine all day long because it's what goes in. It's not processed. There's not chemicals. There's not heavy whipping cream and, you know, tons of butter and all these things that go into these dishes that make America fat. You know, and that's the truth, you know, and there's actually shows out there and there's documentaries about why, you know, Europe and Europeans are so healthy and eat the same foods and why America is so fat, you know, because they just cook it the wrong way and they put the wrong things into it. And that goes to your question right now is, you know, when you sit down and you look at these calorie levels and you think to yourself, what are we doing wrong? As restaurateurs, Janara and I went back to the drawing board and we said, we better fix some of these recipes because we don't want that on there. You know, who wants to have a carbonara that's 2,500 calories? So we went back and we looked at, okay, well, you know what? Instead of heavy whipping cream, maybe we use something different. Or instead of, you know, heavy butter, we use something else. And we went through every recipe and we tweaked them to make them, you know, translatable to the average guests that was dining at a restaurant so they could fit it into their 2,500 calorie day or their 3,500 calorie day. But it was scary. I mean, it was very, very eye-opening. And I was so glad we did that exercise. Sure. Well, that really was leading me into my question. So I'm glad you talked about that because my question to the expert today is um, these drugs that people are taking that tend to have them eating the same foods, just less. And this might be a little bit of a silly question, but I'm just curious. Are you seeing more food left on the plate? No. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. So, you know, at Tuscan Prime, I mean, I'll use Tuscan Prime because I spend most of my time there. So Tuscan Prime is an Italian chop house and dolce bar. We have amazing over the top desserts. We're here in Annapolis um, and we're busier than ever. And our portion sizes are larger. And, you know, I have guests coming in and I don't know if it's because a lot of our guests that come in and I mean, I shouldn't say we're just a special occasion restaurant, but we're not. But I guess they're coming in to celebrate a special occasion. So they order the appetizers, the salads, 
you know, the pastas and they put everything in from lobster tails to shrimp to whatever they're ordering and, you know, lobster ravioli. And we do these huge tomahawks and I mean, crazy portion sizes. Cause I mean, obviously everything is Instagrammable friendly and you want to be everybody taking pictures and we have all these amazing dishes. Yes, they take it home, but I, I don't see a lot left on, on the plates. I mean, people are really dining and enjoying and eating and um, what's nice is they do take it home, obviously. But to answer your question, I don't see people saying, oh, well, you know, I'm trying to lose weight or I'm on a diet and I just want a half portion or, you know, box the other half up. And I really see everybody out there enjoying themselves and enjoying their dining experiences and ordering a lot of food. I mean, if you go on to Yelp and you go on to Google and you look at pictures or you Google, you know, Tuscan Prime Annapolis and you go into the gallery of all the pictures of what our guests are actually taking pictures of and posting, you're going to see the portion sizes are are pretty large. Our chicken parm is huge. And I mean, there's a, you know, I don't see a lot of uh, full plates, let's say that. So good for us because they love the food right. and they're enjoying it. You know, bad for the weight loss industry because, right. you know, or good for the weight loss industry because there's more people wanting to use the drugs. Right. I, yeah. For that industry, that's for sure. Yeah, but, um, I was just curious, and you know, how are people doing this? They got to be eating less because they're losing weight on these drugs. And it's, I was just curious because eating and, and eating is such a big part of entertainment, of enjoyment, of satisfaction in life, of family. If you think about all the gathering, all our gatherings as a family are all involved in food and good food and people eating and, and enjoying the taste. And that's why people come there. You talked about people coming to your restaurant for celebrations because they are enjoying the entire experience. I and mean, you didn't talk about the experience of your restaurant. And since this is a food show, I think it's important that we not only talk about the food, but we talk about the decor. The decor of when you walk in and you say, I need to sit here. I need to take a picture right here, right now. And you get that feeling in that restaurant. Your restaurant tells us, I need to take a picture. And I'm saying this as just a guest walking in because I know nothing about the restaurant business. But what I do know is what I like and what I find exciting, thrilling, picture worthy, something I want to do again. And that's to me is important when I walk into a restaurant. And so, Again, my expert, aren't people lucky? Like I'm an attorney, I get to ask all these cool questions. And you have an expert at this. We're never gonna do this again, so enjoy this tonight. Cause this is it, we're doing this one time where I'll ask the questions and you get to hear the expert response. But is the experience, not only the food, but also what we're looking at, what we're seeing, what we're smelling, the whole ambiance of the situation. Okay, so I'm going to give you my two cents, and I 100% believe that the experience and the atmosphere and the wow factor is much more important than the food. And every restaurant, food is important. I'm not taking that away. Obviously, you want to go and you want to have quality and you want to get what you pay for. So I'm not taking that part away from the dining experience. But I had a very good friend in Florida, and I every interview that I'm asked this question, I say the same thing because she said it and it hit home to me and it's so instilled in my brain. She said, I eat atmosphere. I eat the energy and atmosphere of the restaurant. The food is all extra. And when we built Tuscan Prime, that was my goal was to create exactly that. From the time you walk in the door, you have a wow factor from the greeting to the the pictures and the walls and the artwork and you want to, and I think I made it too much because Janara says to me all the time, we, it takes so long for them to get to the front door, to the table, to order the food and to dine that we got to kick them out because they're still taking pictures before they order, you know, because we made it so picture friendly and so over the top and so well that everywhere they go, they take a picture, whether they're at the front door at our Chow Bella wall to artwork in our speakeasy, vibey lounge to our bathrooms. I mean, our, our number one selfies are taken in the bathrooms at our restaurant. Cause you know, you know, I always talk about our bathrooms, but they are spectacular. Well, I actually went in there the last time I was there and I hate going to foreign bathrooms. It's just 
one of those weird things that I have in me. I hate it. But I said, all right, let me check this out. And it really is as spectacular as she says, go check out the bathroom. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> well, you know, I always say if the bathroom's disgusting, you don't want to see the kitchen. So, you know, I started with the bathroom first. Janara worked on the kitchen. I worked on the bathrooms. Right. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. So wait, but, see, we're well, talking about atmosphere. And I want people to envision, like when I talk to a jury, I want them to envision what the atmosphere is there. Like, these are just not like pictures that you picked up in Target or Walmart. These are like pictures. They are real, like, like, like you might as well have had Picasso there. These are <laughs> real pictures. This is not standard Walmart stuff, you know? No. This is like real deal pictures. Yeah, so what we did was we found an amazing artist in Greece um, and we reached out to him and we asked him if we could commission him to use some of his artwork. And we used his artwork and we blew it up into these huge canvases and we had them set in these huge hand done wood frames that we custom ordered. I mean, the artwork is over the top. It's amazing. It, it, I put a lot of time and effort into it. It's not just like Stephanie said, we just went and bought pictures. I mean, we thought out every single piece of artwork and every artwork is named after our cocktails. So we have this amazing picture of this man. I call it, it's one of our cocktails called the smoking man. And it's a, um, really cool artsy and three dimensional. You know, we have this woman with flowers in her hair and we have these big metal flowers to make it three dimensional. And, um, it's just amazing pieces of art. And, it's so important to me. I mean, one of our biggest walls, we have Dorothea McCurry, who's a runway uh, model out of Milan. We commissioned her to do a picture of that vibey young Sophia Loren and everybody in the restaurant, every guest dining at every table, they have bets. Is it Sophia Loren or is it somebody else? And then sometimes they even think it's me. I'm like, would I put myself that big on a wall? But anyway, um, but it's true. We thought through every detail of every piece of art and we commissioned her from Italy. We got a hold of her photographer. We bought rights to that picture. We framed it and we painted it on the wall and we did artwork around it. So every bit of that restaurant, we thought through decor and details and images and pictures to make that wow experience. Because, you know, people look at that, you know, if they're going in to pay for an experience, I want them to have the overall experience, not just the food you know, the visual experience and being able to enjoy that, that wow experience. And that's so important to me. So I'm glad you brought that up and I'm glad you noticed it because it's important to me. So it's nice to know a guest in my restaurant is also enjoying the art as much as I do. Of course, of course, because like you said, you know, food is nice. You know, when it's bad food, put it this way, you know, when it's bad food, like it changes your perspective on the restaurant itself. But as long as the food is okay enough, you know, like from five to 10. And then you have this amazing ambience and decorum. That restaurant, it just shoots out like a rocket, like a rocket, because that's what people want. They want to go out. They want to enjoy their friends, family, relationships, and do it in a place that yells, I'm great. I'm amazing. And I want you to be as amazing as I am. Yeah. That's what it feels like. And you know what? I think we're very lucky and we're blessed in the industry that we're in because restaurants, like you said, really affect every area or a part of every area of everything you do, whether it's a business deal, celebrating a graduation. Uh, we've had so many marriage proposals in our restaurant. And have um, you really? Yeah, we've done so many of them. I mean, I, I did one. It was so cute. They gave me the ring when they came in right. and, um, and he said, come up with something unique. And I thought, oh, my God. And first off, they gave the diamond ring to my server. And the server's like, I am not going to be responsible for this engagement ring. <laughs> and I was like, okay, what are we going to do? So we had we have um, homemade beignets um, on the dessert menu, and they're served in a Ferris wheel. And each beignet is on one of the little carriages on, the, on this metal Ferris wheel. So I mm -hmm. said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to put all the beignets and on the top, we're going to put the box on the top of the Ferris wheel. And we had the box of, you know, the, the ring box with it open with the ring. And we layered the, 
the tray with roses and two champagne glasses and we had ferris wheels and we had um when it's an anniversary in our restaurant we have heart-shaped sparklers and we put a heart-shaped sparkler on the tray and we went out and we lit the heart-shaped sparkler and the ring was on top and you proposed at the restaurant so we've done a ton of proposals i mean it's just amazing because we've um, we've gotten to celebrate so many cool events there from engagements to baby sprinkles to everything. So um, it's a, it's a very cool world to be involved in when you're an owner and you're actively involved in your restaurant. So you get to meet so many amazing people and, and be a part of so much of their lives and their activities. Sure. And, you know, we can even talk about how food comes into play, even for a funeral, even sitting Shiva. Even, you know, situations that aren't happy, but they, the food or food in, in and of itself can change even those moments. Yeah. We actually did a, a funeral on Sunday at Tuscan Prime. We had, um, it was booked for 50. We had about 40 come in, but the same thing because food, especially Italian food, Italian food is such a comfort food and it really, food brings people together, whether it's a joyous occasion or a sad occasion. And um, it makes you feel good. It's warming and um, it allows people to connect, you know, gives them the ability to uh, let's talk about our last column that we just wrote, Steph. I mean, I literally just yes. did dating and dining. I, you know, we started off the show saying one of the things that we're working on. Um, I've had the um, pleasure and the opportunity to write a column, Restaurant Diva Speaks. And right. every other week we get to pick a topic. And the first topic that um, Stephanie and I came up with was dating and dining. And it's such a cool article. And I hope everybody gets a chance to read it. If you go to restaurantdiva.com and you click on, we actually have a link now for um, our column, but it goes over how much food tells you about somebody. I mean, even dating, you're on a first date. You can tell so much about who your date is by what they order what restaurant they pick, what wine, you know, it's funny. I start the article by saying you need to know whether you're going to dine or dash, you know, if it's not the person that you want to be with, you know, how do you dash, you know, it's that, that funny thing. But you know, if they pick Italian food, what's their cultural life or their family life, life like if they pick spicy food, are they adventurous? I mean, there's it's food tells so much about a person. So it's such a cool thing, you know, and we just wrote about it. So they got to read the article and they'll know more. Right. about Absolutely. It Go and read this article. Go on there, read the article, and um, you're going to see a lot more of them. They're going to be twice a month, and they're all going to be of really interesting topics that you want to know. Things that yeah. you say to yourself, I want to know the answer to this. And you're Yeah, our next one's going to be interesting. It's uh, tipping in the restaurant world. So we'll have to see, are you the big tipper or the cheapo? Right, <laughs> exactly. You know, and tipping is a really interesting sort of topic because it's confusing today. Like, I, I'm confused. I'm in a restaurant and there's all these people around me when I, you know, you go to a nice, I'm talking about a nice restaurant. You go into a nice restaurant and you have these people, you don't even know what their names are. Like, I know the waiter and the waitress and maybe even the bartender. Then you have the wine guy. And then you have some other guy who's standing there like in a suit and tie. Yeah, with all the Mater D, the person that, that's running the floor. Yeah, but you got all these people kind of looking at you. You're buying a bottle of wine. You have that guy looking at you. And you're like, who am I supposed to tip here? And how much am I supposed to give them? Because they're all kind of staring at me and I have no idea. Am I supposed to give this guy, what, 10%, 15%, 20%, yeah. 30%? It's very confusing because when you add up all these percentages, you've already paid for another meal. Right, right. Well, and then you have those that don't tip at all. I mean, I can't tell Why you. Are there people who don't tip? Yeah. Oh, are you kidding me? We literally had to start um, on busy nights adding a automatic tip to checks because then you... So depending on... I didn't even order, thought about that. Oh, yes. I can't tell you how many nights that we've had servers come to me and say they didn't even leave anything. So it's interesting because if you go to Europe, um, the European culture, they build the tip into the check. So for example, if you're in Italy, you're in Rome, you don't tip in Italy. So anybody coming from Italy, they do not tip because the tip is built into the checks. So when mm -hmm. Europeans come into this country and they have dinner or they're out to dinner or whatever, and you're in a big city, like I'll just use New York, 
they just assume it's the same as their culture because American culture is very different. And then you have other cultures that, you know, again, are they cheap? Are they not cheap? Um, they don't tip. I mean, it's, it's a very interesting, controversial topic. And that's why, you know, when we were talking about the next topic for our column, it, what's the question out there? Do you tip to tip or not to tip? Because there's a lot of restaurants now putting employees on salary and full time because so many servers, you know, when they work for 363 or 565 or whatever the base is, depending on the state you're in, there's so many of them that will get stiffed and, and tables that will leave. And, you know, you think this person's living on that. They live a hundred percent on those tips. What happens if somebody doesn't get a tip? What do you do for them? Well, do you do anything? Can you do anything? So the short answer is it depends on the restaurant owner. I mean, Janar and I are very, um, we're very good to our employees. And if the table gets up and doesn't tip, we'll, te- we'll typically take care of that employee. But many restaurants, they do not. Um, if they're they're stiff, they're stiffed. I mean, think of these big restaurant groups. I mean, if it's, if they own 10, 20, 30, think of Tal and these lot, you know, these big restaurant groups, they're a manager can't make that decision. And they have 30 servers on the floor. If 30 servers get stiffed in a night, you know, based on volume, a manager can't make a decision to pay out that tip or 20% or 25%. So most of the servers, if they're stiff, they're stiffed. Wow. That's crazy. I never thought about that. Oh and yeah. Then- and then we that's it for the night. The time. We deal with it all the time. I can't even tell you. On a, on a weekend, there's at least one or two tables a night that don't get tipped. Wow. So is there any, because I've been to restaurants where it says, you know, five or more people, there's an automatic tip, a gratuity actually, as they call it, put on the bill. Is that why these restaurants are sort of steering in that direction? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I mean, we we've done it at Tuscan Prime. If it's um, six or more, it's an automatic 20 percent tip. If it's 12 or more, it's 25 percent. It's automatically added as a service fee on the check and it goes to the server. Um, And on large, busy evenings, like where we have a lot of parties and the turnover is just greater because obviously, you know, there's such high volume. There's automatic 20 percent tip added to every single check. Oh, that's very see, but yeah, that- a lot of restaurants are doing that now. If you even in New York, I noticed it this weekend. I was there. Um, it was my daughter's twenty fifth birthday, and we spent the weekend there celebrating her birthday like we always do. And I noticed it on one of the checks that they had automatic tip. Why do you think hotels um, always have an automatic gratuity or room service automatic gratuity? Because people don't tip. I didn't know that. Uh-huh. That's crazy. Yeah, that's a whole nother show. <laughs> yeah, that is a whole nother show because, you know, that would be a horrible thing to, you know, at least set your goals on a certain amount of money for the night. I'm sure people, I'm sure service set their goals for the night of what they plan on earning. And you get a couple of tables that stiff you, you're basically walking out earning uh, a lot less than you planned on. And it, it happens. Wow. It definitely happens. Yeah. Do you ever go up to the customer? Um, we do, I mean, it's a very touchy subject. I mean, because you don't want to embarrass them. You don't want to insult them. Right. Um, what if it was a service issue? You know, we're very involved in every review, you know, whether it's at the table, my thing is if they're in the restaurant and there's an issue, you fix it right then and there. Mm-hmm. So what happens if the server gave horrible service and I mean, that's an indication too. You know, maybe they had a horrible experience. I mean, you don't know. Every situation's different. Um, we've we've addressed it with a few tables. You know, we'll go up and we'll say, oh, we noticed that, you know, there was no gratuity left. Was there a problem? Was there an issue with the table? It's a good indicator for a manager to fix the situation right then and there. And if it was a service issue, you know, what was the problem? Was it food? Was it service? Was it timing? Um, what was the issue? Because, you know, once they leave and then they write a bad review, you're fixing it anyway. So- if you're if they're already there at the table, it's a great indicator for the manager to fix it. So I am a strong believer that address the issue either you're there, but it's it's situational too. You don't know, you know. Right, right. No, I could see that. Uh, you know, even when I've had bad service, I've always felt though that I'm going to give a tip because I know people live off of these tips. Of course, 
And uh, I've always felt that that's the wrong thing to do. I may never come back to that restaurant ever again. <laughs> you may never that's see a problem. It. Do you see what you just said? That's a problem. Because as a restaurateur, you just said the main thing why I go to, I make our managers go to every single table and address every single item. Because the last thing that I want is to never happen is for my guests to not come back because the server gave horrible service because the food can be amazing. The experience can be amazing. And the server could have affected that. And I want to know about it before they leave, you know, and to get them back and give them a $50 gift card or whatever it is. I want to fix that because the last thing I want to happen is for you to say, I will never go back and I'll tell 20 people because word of mouth is so powerful and people talk about good things but they talk way more about the bad things. No, that's true. And especially with servers, if you get a bad server, like, there are things that I've had bad servers and literally I've said, I'm never going back to that restaurant. Even if I love the food, I'm always like, yeah, I'll get good food somewhere else. Yeah. Well, um, and seriously, the server has played a big role in my own dining experience. When I feel like someone is, is a good server, and makes me feel like they care about my experience in their restaurant, I can tell. And it's, it's a place that I'll definitely revisit. And when it's a server who's like talking to another server and- Or on their cell phone yeah. or not caring or- right. oh, um, I notice all that too, Janar and I notice. And the ones that are amazing, I'm always recruiting them. And I can, <laughs> let me tell you something, I've been kicked out of a few restaurants and told not to come are back. You a sure? Are you a poacher? You're poaching people. <laughs> hey, you know, <laughs> if they're amazing, I'm like, hmm, you interested in, you need a job? Yeah. <laughs> I've yep. done it a few times. And Janara laughs because you know what? The people you want are the ones that are working, not the ones not working. Yeah, definitely. You want the <laughs> hard work. And, and they don't want to get rid of those because employers know who the hard workers are. Employers know who they want on their staff. And they also know who they don't want. But guess what? We have a minute left, so we're not even getting bathroom talking on this show. Oh my God. See, yeah. we have been here so fast. We are over 59 minutes. Wow. And as everybody knows, the show is one hour. So if we go over, and this show is so perfect because it's so connected, and it's one continuous stream of chit chat that I want to end it on time and I want to end it on the high note that it's been this entire show. So with that being said, you can see what a great partnership this is going to be. And uh, stay tuned. And because has been. And has been, exactly. Will continue to be. Absolutely. So you need to stay tuned and continue listening because I think today was very informative. I think you got more out of today than any, any other show, if you ask my opinion. Well, because that's why we always said, you know what? That's why it's the Steps of Service with Stephanie and Michelle because the show is us. That's right. And this show tonight is something to listen to because you can relate to it. Believe me, you can. Good night. Good night. Bye, wifey. Bye, wife. <laughs> Good night.